Okay, uh, my name is Mark Black. I'm one of the faculty in the anatomy cell biology department, and uh, I guess I'm your, your contact for all your neuro lectures, so you can either thank me or shoot me, whatever, however you feel. Uh, what I want to talk about today uh, is a little bit about uh, spinal cord reflexes. Um, and what I've done is I've kind of taken the lecture that I usually give to first year students and ramped up some parts of it that um, I thought might be uh, of, of interest uh, to you guys. It actually relates to the question that was asked at the end about spasticity and what are some of the, uh, the mechanisms that, that are thought to be involved. Um, as, as a preview, there's an enormous amount of work that's been done trying to sort out what's actually the cause of spasticity. And there's a remarkable amount of disagreement in the field. Um, so for someone who's not in the field trying to get a sense of where the field is, it's not easy. Uh, but I'll tell you at least what I think, uh, or at least a little bit of what I've learned to, to get ready for that. So anyway, um, I don't have any disclosures. We're obligated to say this. Um, this is more relevant for um, the first year students. Uh, but I will point out there's a, uh, an online resource. Uh, it's actually a neuroscience textbook uh, that's published for free by the University of Texas. And it, it's really a very good online resource for neuroscience if you're interested uh, for some, some uh, basic and, and not so basic stuff. And this happens to be a link to the chapter that relates to reflexes, but that'll also get you to the site so you can see all the other kind of stuff that's there. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, I think, uh, extremely well done. So this is a, a box diagram overview of uh, the motor systems. Uh, when we give this lecture in, in, in the first year neuroscience, it's kind of part of the motor system uh, component. Um, and it's, it's, the purpose of the slide is to kind of highlight a number of areas of the brain that are involved in motor control uh, from the cortex on down. So you have some higher level motor cortical areas, premotor and supplementary regions very much involved in sort of motor planning, motor programming, uh, kind of getting, getting together the kinematics of the movement. Uh, this is what the movement is supposed to accomplish and, and so on. Uh, and then the primary motor cortex um, contributes to kinematics, but also more kinetics in terms of generating patterns of activity that will then actually allow for the, the relevant muscle movements to take place or contractions to take place. So you actually accomplish uh, the goal of the movement activity and there are brainstem areas as well that contribute to the process, all of which feed down onto the motor neurons in the spinal cord. Um, and what you can see in the, in the schematic is that it's um, there's sort of a both a parallel as well as well as a hierarchical kind of uh, arrangement to the circuitry. Uh, the hierarchical you can see from premotor supplementary down to primary to brainstem to spinal cord, and then along with that are parallel circuits. Uh, by which projections from, say, premotor and supplementary can go directly to the spinal cord, or can go to brainstem areas bypassing motor cortex and so on. Um, the output from the primary motor cortex is especially involved, as, as uh, Helen talked about, in the control of distal muscles, your ability to fractionate finger movements as an example. Um, not that it doesn't do anything for more proximal muscles, but a lot of the proximal muscle activity is really uh, driven by centers in the brainstem that are under cortical control. So when you engage in a particular volitional activity uh, that involves both proximal and distal muscles, it's kind of your cortical projections down to the spinal cord to control the distal muscles, uh, and then your cortical projections to the brainstem, which then goes to the spinal cord to control your proximal muscles to set the posture that you need to actually carry out whatever you're gonna do with your distal muscles uh, in a really simple-minded kind of way. Um, and then, in general, most of the connections to the motor neurons are not direct, uh, are via inner neurons within the spinal cord, although there are notable exceptions from the primary motor cortex, which actually has direct monosynaptic connections to the uh, motor neurons in the spinal cord. Um, we don't really have time to get into the details of what's going on up here. I'm going to really focus on circuitry that exists in the spinal cord for controlling uh, various types of movements, uh, and these tend to all be kind of these reflex movements, things that can be generated even when the spinal cord is disconnected from the rest of the brain by, by injury. Uh, this slide just is an opportunity for me to talk about basal ganglia and cerebellum. I'm not going to do that today. Um, so I want to dive right into the reflexes. 
Uh, and this is a common definition that the reflex is a relatively stereotyped involuntary response to a specific sensory stimulus. And in general terms, it's going to involve the contraction of some muscles and the relaxation of their antagonists. And both the contraction and relaxation responses are actively generated by the nervous system. And I'll go through some circuits that kind of show that. Uh, this is a, a very generalized kind of schematic for a reflex arc, and it would apply to almost any reflex. Uh, you have a receptor in the periphery, which is specialized to transduce the energy of the sensory stimulus into uh, action potentials in the afferent neuron for the reflexes I'm going to be talking about. These are all dorsal ganglion neurons. Uh, and that will relay the signal into the spinal cord. Uh, and similar kinds of things exist at the level of the brain, but we're going to focus on spinal cord. And then by what I've termed here central connections, and I'll say a little more about that shortly, the signal is relayed on to the uh, efferent neuron, which would be a motor neuron, to activate uh, a receptor or to at least control a recept an effector, which would be the muscle. Um, now, in terms of the central connections, most commonly there's one or more neurons that are interposed between the afferent neuron and the efferent neuron. And these serve to transform the nature of the signal that's brought in in one way or another. Uh, it can spread it out to make a, a very global response to a, a focal stimulus. Um, it can change what is an excitatory input to an inhibitory input through a, an inhibitory neuron and, and so on. Uh, there's lots of different variations on the theme here. Uh, occasionally, and this is true for the, the phasic stretch reflexes that you commonly test clinically, uh, the motor, the afferent neuron makes a direct monosynaptic contact on the motor neuron. Uh, what I've also tried to show here uh, by this arrow, which is not a great symbol, but it's the point is there's a lot of descending projections that project down onto the central connections uh, of the, um, the, the reflex circuits. And these descending projections do modulate the activity. They influence the gain and how information can pass through the circuit uh, from the afferent neuron to the efferent neuron. So there is a certainly an important modulation that takes place uh, from the brain onto these circuits. Uh, and one of the important functional consequences of that is it keeps the reflexes from interfering with intended activities. Uh, you don't want to have reflexes be triggered that would be co counter to what you're actually trying to do. Um, from a, a, an injury point of view, and I'll talk a little bit about this as we go on, uh, if there's lesions that somehow take out the afferent neuron or the efferent neuron, the reflexes are going to be diminished or lost, depending on the extent to which you've actually lost the populations of neurons. Uh, when you have lesions to the brain systems that project down, the long-term consequence tends to be an exaggeration of the reflexes. And the explanation for that is not entirely clear, and I'll try to at least give you some of my understanding of how that comes about. Acutely with these brain injuries, a lot of times you actually get a, a suppression of reflexes, especially for spinal cord injuries. But the long-term chronic thing would be exaggeration. Now, one of the things I said with regard to a reflex is it's a relatively stereotype kind of response. And I, I do want to qualify that. I think it's really important to do that. And this slide helps me do it, although it's not great. Uh, the point is reflexes are not absolutely stereotyped, but they're very much adaptable to a particular uh, context. Uh, and this slide kind of makes that point, although it's not exactly a reflex, but the same kind of thing applies to reflexes, and I'll show you an example of that later after I talk about specific circuits. But in this, uh, on the left, what you're seeing is an individual who's assuming a particular posture. Uh, with one hand, they're holding the edge of a table. The other hand, they're holding a, a lever that basically can provide a perturbation. And so the lever is going to pull them forward toward the table, and the instruction here is to maintain this posture, that is to resist this perturbation, and one of the ways they're going to do that is by uh, contracting the extensor, so they kind of hold themselves rigid and don't pull themselves forward. Uh, and you can see that in the schematic of the muscle activity down here, that the uh, extensor muscle fires a lot to uh, resist this perturbation. Um, in the example here, on, on the right side, the individual has the same posture. They're holding the same device to apply the perturbation. But now they're holding a cup of water in the hand, and the instruction is don't spill the water. Uh, and in this case, when the perturbation uh, is made, if they did the same thing as on this side, they would extend the arm, and they'd spill the water because it would just pull it forward. So in fact, you're going to relax that muscle so you can activate the flexors uh, and 
you can see at least the relaxation of the extensor in this case. Obviously, this is not a simple reflex, but the same kind of concept actually applies to reflexes. Um, the example I'll give you uh, a bit later on in, in the lecture concerns uh, the reflexes triggered by the Golgi tendon organ, which Dr. Pearson talked a about a little bit. In the perfectly resting condition, that leads to it responds to a contraction of a muscle, uh, and it will lead to uh, the relaxation of that muscle. Uh, that same reflex during walking actually leads to excitation. So reflexes really are under a lot of control. They're adapted to whatever's going on. So you don't want to think of them as being absolutely stereotyped. Okay, so one of the reflexes I want to talk about is the withdrawal reflex. And Dr. Pearson has already gone over that, so it's going to make it really easy for me to do because I don't have a whole lot to add. Um, it's often referred to as a flexor reflex, but it is important to keep in mind that the withdrawal ref reflex circuitry is, is it's a circuit that's there to sort of mediate or at least begin a response to a noxious stimulus. And the goal is to remove the injured part of the body from the offending agent. Uh, and the circuitry exists so that you'll activate whatever muscles are necessary to remove your body from the injuring agent. Uh, the example that's most commonly shown, which I'm going to show as well, is stepping on a tack. And obviously, the major muscles involved are flexors. Uh, but if you happen to bump into something sharp that hits your thigh, you don't want to flex your leg. That's going to make it worse. And in fact, you won't flex your leg you'll extend. So the circuitry is there to, to withdraw the your injured part of the body from the injuring agent. And it really depends where the injur, injury occurs. So it's, there's a lot of circuitry in the spinal cord to accommodate the many different kinds of scenarios you can anticipate. Um, so this is the general circuitry. Uh, it's, a, it's a polysynaptic circuit. So the afferent neuron comes in usually from a nociceptor. It's a receptor specialized to detect the kind of injury that would produce t tissue damage. Uh, so it's pain producing. And it's through chains of interneurons. Uh, and what it's going to do on the ipsilateral side is it's going to activate the necessary withdrawal muscles to remove the injured part of the body from the injuring agent. Uh, and it's also going to cause a relaxation uh, of those muscles that would antagonize the withdrawal response. And it does that by inhibiting the motor neurons that uh, innervate those antagonistic muscles. And you can see that through this inhibitory interneuron. Uh, it also will activate circuits to maintain an upright posture or whatever is an appropriate posture for the circumstance. Uh, and oftentimes that'll involve connections to the other side. That would be the cross support response that Dr. Pearson talked about uh, by activating the contralateral support muscles. So that's the basic circuit. Uh, and there's a couple of points I want to highlight about it using the example of stepping on a tack. Uh, and the circuit is shown here. And this is very much the same as, as what, what uh, Helen, Helen showed. Uh, a point I want to make is the painful stimulus is actually applied to a very discrete point on the body, uh, some point on the, uh, on the sole of the foot. Yet the response is really very global. Um, you're going to activate uh, flexors, especially at the knee and at the hip, to get your foot off the tack. Um, and so part of the circuitry of the withdrawal response is to activate quite broadly and globally those muscles that will help in accomplishing the goal of uh, removing the body part from the injuring agent. And that circuitry is, is mediated uh, at the level of the spinal cord. And you can kind of see some of it here where the afferent neuron comes in at say an S1 level, uh, but through connections to interneurons as well as the branching of uh, the efferent neuron itself, it's going to end up activating neurons at multiple levels of the cord so that you can activate all the muscles that will help you in the goal. Now, there's actually two points I want to make, two more points I want to make about this. One, I want to just go back to this slide. Uh, this is a really important point. Um, what we're seeing here for this efferent neuron is just one of a number of branches that it forms upon entering the spinal cord, or a subset of branches. Every afferent neuron, dorsal ganglion neuron, as it projects into the spinal cord, divides into lots of branches. And each of the branches contributes to a different kind of circuit. Uh, Helen talked about branches that would contribute to the ALS. These would be the circuits that will relay pain information on up to the spinal cord, excuse me, on up to the brain and, and higher. Um, 
what I'm talking about here are just those circuits that exist at the level of the spinal cord. Now the other point is in terms of the withdrawal response, that's really your initial response to the pain. In a healthy individual, that signal about pain is now going to be relayed up to the brain and your brain is going to take over and generate subsequent response. So it's not like the entire response that you see uh, when you step on attack is just the withdrawal response. In fact, that's just the very beginnings, which you probably can't even separate without fancy equipment from how your brain taking over to control the subsequent response. That's in a healthy individual. Uh, in individuals that have injuries that kind of disconnect the brain from the spinal cord, then the kind of response you see is more related just to the reflex response, or at least the circuitry that exists at the level of the spinal cord without control from higher levels. Does that make sense? I think it's an important concept. When you think about the withdrawal response, I mean, we all have it, but it's at most the very, very beginnings, the first, you know, 100, 200 milliseconds in the response that you actually see before the brain then takes over and, and controls the, what you do subsequently. Anyway, um, so a key point here is it tends to be a very global response. And it's also a prolonged response. Obviously, you don't want it to be a phasic thing where you lift your foot off the tack and then the muscles relax and your foot falls right back on the tack. That has no adaptive value. Uh, so it, it's a prolonged response. And this next slide showing this cross support is just kind of reinforcing those points. It's a very global response. And the reason I kind of go into this is I think, at least my understanding, and if my understanding is wrong, I hope you'll correct me, but when in individuals experience injuries that kind of disconnect the spinal cord from the brain, either completely or partially, um, these reflexes get very exaggerated over time, at least in the chronic condition. Um, and I'd like to at least give you my sense of part of what's going on. Is, is that correct, by the way, to say that withdrawal responses or re responses to cutaneous kinds of inputs can trigger kind of fairly massive, not necessarily normal, but massive kind of withdrawal responses, type responses. Is, is that correct? I mean, I've never seen it. I only read about it. Are you talking about a patient with pathology? Or no, with, with pathology, who has basically lost the connection from the brain to the spinal cord. I see it sometimes in the Asia exams where you're poking with the hand a little too hard and they bring the whole leg up um, and you get, it's a little startling. But. So what I said is kind of correct, is not so correct? I mean, I want to learn. If I'm saying something wrong, I mean, you, you guys do this for a living. I don't. I lecture based on what I read, but I don't actually live it. I think those are all the reflexes that are any kind of stimulus implies a response. So you can get a very kind of global and, and okay, good, because that kind of will fit what, I, what comes next. Okay. So I made this kind of crude diagram to kind of illustrate what I think is an important point. So the circle here just represents the spinal cord. And you have motor neurons here, and this just represents inner neurons and chains of inner neurons. Uh, and in the context of uh, the withdrawal response, these would be the inputs from the nociceptors out in the periphery to these inner neurons that ultimately connect with the relevant motor neurons. Now, the fact that you have all these inner neurons involved really provides a lot of opportunity for modulation by other inputs, uh, such as descending inputs from the brainstem and the cerebral cortex. Uh, they also get inputs from other cutaneous receptors. And in the healthy individual, uh, these descending inputs tend to kind of set the gain of the system so that generally the reflex would only be triggered by a noxious stimulus, um, as opposed to just any old stimulus. That kind of can activate that circuitry because there's a lot of inputs, even local ones, as indicated here, to that circuitry. But what can happen when you lose these descending projections is you lose this modulation. And so the gain in the system changes. And it's changing for multiple reasons. It's not only because you've lost this that the system changes, uh, but as a result of losing this, these neurons change their responsiveness to their other inputs. So they become much more sensitive and it becomes much easier to elicit these kinds of responses. Uh, and they tend to be, have the characteristic of being very global. So you provide a painful stimulus and you get a very global response, and it tends to be fairly prolonged. It's not a really phasic response. 
And so at least that's the way I think about how uh, these kinds of injuries can result in this sort of abnormal form of the withdrawal reflex that's seen in individuals that experience these kinds of injuries. Uh, at least that's my thinking about it. Um, I'll give more specifics when it comes to things like spasticity, where more is known about it. Uh, I also would value your thoughts on whether this idea has any merit, or at least your thinking about it. Uh, we can do that later uh, when we finish up the lecture. Okay, so that's really all I wanted to say about the, uh, the withdrawal response, or the withdrawal reflex. Uh, I'd like to now turn attention to uh, reflexes of muscle origin, and I'm going to talk about uh, reflexes that originate from two receptors, the muscle spindles and then the Golgi tendon organs. Um, and so I'll say a little bit about the receptors and how they work and the kinds of stimuli that actually activate them. Uh, I like this schematic even though it's not in color because it really shows very nicely the arrangement of, of the different receptors. This would be the muscle spindle, uh, which tends to be situated in the belly of the muscle. And the receptive elements are generally described as being in parallel with the force generating elements of the muscle, the extrafusal muscle fibers out here. Uh, as we'll see, the muscle spindle is really specialized to do two things, detect length and detect changes in length. And so the fact that it's or, orient, organized kind of in parallel with the uh, long axis of the force generating elements kind of fits that very nicely. The Golgi tendon organ is situated in the tendon at the muscle tendon junction. It's specialized to detect the tension generated by contracting muscles. And what you're seeing here, which is one of the few schematics I've seen that actually shows the actual situation, is only a minor subset of the muscle fibers actually insert into the receptor. Uh, and when those muscle fibers that insert into the receptor contract, the tension they generate is very directly transmitted to the receptor, uh, and then the receptor will signal the CNS about the force of that, or the tension generated by that contraction. So first I'll talk about muscle spindles, and then I'll say a bit about the Golgi tendon organs. Uh, so here's a schematic of the muscle spindle, um, and it basically consists of specialized types of muscle fibers referred to as intrafusal muscle fibers, uh, as opposed to the extrafusal, which are the force generating elements. And it's enclosed in a connective tissue capsule, uh, and my understanding is the entire receptor is enclosed in that. It's not shown that way here just for, uh, uh, to make it a little simpler. Uh, there's two general types of uh, intrafusal fibers referred to as nuclear bag and nuclear chain. Uh, the name really derives from the original histology that was done looking at these structures. In the nuclear bag fibers, you have a collection of nuclei in the equatorial region causing a nice bulge, uh, hence nuclear bag. Uh, in the nuclear chain fibers, the nuclei tend to be linearly arrayed in the equatorial region, so you don't have that bulge. Uh, the nuclear chain fibers, as far as uh, has been studied to date um, are not heterogeneous. So a nuclear chain fiber is a nuclear chain fiber. Uh, they all seem to be about the same. But the nuclear bag fibers actually are heterogeneous. There's two major types referred to as dynamic and static. Um, and the dynamic one is really specialized for detecting length change. Uh, the static one can also detect length change, uh, but can also detect steady state length. And we'll see how all this works. The nuclear chain fibers are, are best uh, optimized for detecting steady state length. Now, um, in terms of sensory innervation, there's two fibers that, that innervate the, the receptor, uh, a 1A fiber and a 2 fiber. Um, the 1A fiber is a large, very large, heavily myelinated axon. It's one of the largest in, in, in our bodies, diameter-wise, uh, and the most rapidly conducting. Uh, there tends to be one per spindle, and it makes specialized contact with all of the intrafusal fibers, both of the nuclear bag types as well as all of the uh, nuclear chain, uh, and it forms these specialized contacts in the equatorial region uh, of the, the receptor. And you can see that in the schematic. Uh, the two fiber is somewhat smaller, not quite as rapidly conducting, uh, and it makes specialized contacts with all of the intrafusal fibers except for the dynamic nuclear bag fiber. So it's really going to be involved in relaying signals that are most related to uh, steady state length. The 1A fiber will relate signals not only related to steady state length, but changes in length as they're occurring. Uh, there's also uh, a motor innervation to these fibers, and this is actually very interesting. It's one of the few receptors out on the body that actually 
whose the, the sensitivity of which can be regulated by the CNS. That's what these uh, these these motor innervations allow. And there's two types: the static and the dynamic. Uh, the static uh, is particularly involved in regulating sensitivity of the nuclear chain fibers as well as the static nuclear bag. The dynamic gamma fiber uh, just regulates the sensitivity of the dy dynamic bag fiber. I'm not going to say a whole lot about the, the gammas until the very end, and I'm going to really only talk about them uh, in one specific context, but it's a very important context. Um, the other point that this makes, which is actually important and sort of I'll refresh your memory when we get to this the relevance in, in, in the lecture, the interfusal fibers do have contractile apparatus, but it tends to be concentrated in the polar regions. It doesn't run through the equatorial region. So when you get contraction of this apparatus, what it does is it, it contracts the polar regions and stretches the equatorial regions. Uh, and that will be important when I talk about gammas and what they do, at least one, one, one aspect of that. Is everybody with me on the spindle? Any questions? Okay. So this is uh, my schematic, fairly crude, uh, of pretty much what we saw on the previous slide, although I'm not showing all the, the specialization within the spindle. I just so, show a representative uh, nuclear bag fiber and a representative nuclear chain fiber. But what I've added to that would be the reflex circuitry. Uh, and for the most part, this is really, uh, it, it has the same information that, that Helen presented, plus a little bit more as it relates to the two fiber. Um, and in, in terms of uh, the circuitry, the one fiber, the 1A, which makes contact with both nuclear bag and nuclear chain fibers, is the fiber that mediates the monosynaptic uh, reflex that you test when you test all your deep tendon reflexes. Um, and so you can see it's going to contact a motor neuron. That's an excitatory interaction. It's a motor neuron uh, that innervates the muscle with the active receptor. It will cause, excite that motor neuron to cause that muscle to contract. And through an inhibitory interneuron, it's a disynaptic circuit, it will inhibit motor neurons to antagonistic muscles, causing those muscles to relax. And so that's the basic circuit for uh, your, your, your sort of phasic stretch reflexes. Um, the two circuit is similar, although tends to be more polysynaptic than monosynaptic. There are monosynaptic interactions with motor neurons to the muscle containing the active receptor. I haven't shown them here because more commonly they're, they're polysynaptic. And there would also be the inhibitory effects as well. I just couldn't add the neurons. It would get too messy. And you can see the gammas here. Well, again, I don't want to talk about those. So that's the basic circuit. So the idea is uh, if something happens to stretch a muscle, that stretch through interactions of the connective tissue elements of the extrafusal fibers, these would be some sort of the extrafusal fibers. I've shown them in a broken view here, but they actually should be continuous across. Uh, will interact with the connective tissue capsule of the receptor. Uh, and so when the extrafusal fibers lengthen, that will be passively transmitted to the intrafusal fibers. Uh, and it's the equatorial region that stretches the most because it's the most deformable part of the cell. And that stretch-induced deformation uh, in this region is sufficient to generate action potentials in the 1A and sometimes the 2 fiber, depending on the nature of the input, and thereby trigger the reflex. So when you tap a tendon, in effect, what you're doing is lengthening this region very, very, sort of very physically, uh, especially in the dynamic bag, and that's going to trigger the muscle contraction that you then are looking for. Okay. Um, this is, uh, uh, let's see if this is going to work. See if I can get this to the, uh, it's not showing very well. Let's do this first. This is an animation that this fellow, I can't pronounce his name, made. How, how do I turn that off for a moment? Those are action potentials. Okay. I'll ask you to get up in a second to turn that back on. Uh, let me see if I can center this a little better. Uh, why is this not working? Let me close this. Try clicking the green dot. 
Now I got to close this window. Uh, uh, I didn't want to do. I'm actually pretty good with computers. <laughs> it's like uh, there's D. Control D. Yeah. Or I'm sorry, Command D. No. No. It's... I know you can get rid of that, but it's not letting me do it right now. It's... So if you oh, if you have an idea, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. There's actually an enormous amount of information in this. Uh, I'm only going to go over a little bit of it, and unfortunately, we're not seeing all of it on here. Um, but this is the spindle. Uh, the green is the dynamic bag fiber, I think. Is that correct? Yes. The yellow would be the static bag, and then this is the nuclear chain fiber, and you're seeing the 1A and the 2 fibers. And these little ball things are the... Uh, action potentials. And the implication in this schematic uh, is that you have action potentials all the time. And that's not correct. When the muscle is relaxed, there really is no activity going back from the spindle. So in this situation, the spindle is under some load to stretch it, and so you're getting a bit of a response. Now, down below, uh, what you're seeing are perturbations to the muscle. So you're basically at a steady state length, then you have a ramp to a new length that you hold, and then you lose that. And what you're seeing above here would be uh, a representative recording from the 1A fiber during this sort of uh, manipulation. And a little lower, you're seeing what happens with the 2 fiber. Unfortunately, I can't make this. I probably could if I played a note. Command minus. There we go. Now I need the noise. So it's over here somewhere? Can everybody hear that? I don't want it to be too annoying. Oh, this, it's just... Yeah. So... When I click this, the muscle lengthens and you get more response. And during the actual ramp period, where it really fires up, that's the 1A the, uh, from the dynamic bag, because it's the dynamic bag that's really sensing that change. Um, and so you get, you get a lot of firing. And then when the muscle length goes back to normal and it kind of gets silent, it's because the 1A, dyna from the, the, the dynamic bag, uh, shuts down. So let me just do that. So, okay, so that's the dynamic. Um, and you can kind of see that here. So when, when, when the muscle length starts to go up, you get this spike in activity, um, and then it holds for a bit, uh, and then it drops uh, when the muscle length goes down. Uh, the two fiber, which is kind of hard to distinguish the signal from that, pretty much doesn't change a whole lot as you go dur during the ramp up and the ramp down. Uh, but when you get to the new length, it fires a little bit faster. And then when it goes back down, it gradually slows down to the, to the baseline. And that kind of gives you an idea of, I can do it up here, uh, of how the system works. And what I'll let you do if you have the interest is kind of go in and activate the dynamic gamma or the static gamma or both and see how it actually changes the response. When you activate the dynamic gamma, you get a much greater response during periods of length change. Uh, when you activate the static gamma, you have a much higher baseline and then that increases its response from there. So it's an opportunity for the CNS to set the, the sensitivity of the spindle to provide the CNS with information about length change information and length information that it needs to modulate the ongoing activity and modulate it optimally. So this is a really nice site if you want to learn a lot about spindles. Uh, I take you through the whole thing, but then I, I won't be able to finish. All right, now.
don't want that. There we go. All right. Um, this is kind of uh, continuing the discussion of, of how spindles respond in a very schematic way. Uh, what, what I walked you through in that uh, animation is basically a ramp up and then the ramp down looking at the 1A response. And so this is showing it schematically during the ramp up, it really fires a lot. Uh, the, when I say the 1A, I really meant the dynamic bag. Uh, you can see that you have greater firing here. Uh, that's going to be from the static bag. Because uh, that's the one that's more sensitive to just whatever the steady state length is. And then when you ramp down, the dynamic bag shuts down so you don't get that signal. And then you get this gradual decrease uh, from this, the static bag. Make sense? And then this is just showing how the, the, two, the two responds. So the two doesn't change all that much. It just goes from whatever the baseline is at this, at this particular length to a slightly higher firing rate. And then it goes back when you uh, lower, lower it down. These two conditions are really the ones that you use a lot um, clinically when you're testing your phasic stretch reflexes. This is the one that's meant to depict the tap of the tendon. I'll talk about that more. It's actually the tendon does more like this, but the point is this is basically all length change. So you go up and you go down, or you go up and down and up and down, and the 1A can follow that. It's incredibly sensitive, and the 1A is following it because of the properties of the dynamic bag fiber. The twos and the static bag really don't respond very much to these very brief kinds of uh, length changes. Okay, so how does this all relate to um, the, the phasic stretch reflexes that you commonly test? Uh, and so what you do is you, you tap the tendon with a percussion hammer, and sort of the general textbook description is that leads to a brief lengthening of the muscle that is passively transmitted to the uh, spindle to generate a brief burst of activity in the efferent neuron, which would be this guy, to excite motor neurons that go back to that muscle to cause it to contract, and then through an inhibitory neuron, inner neuron, it'll inhibit motor neurons to the antagonistic muscles so those will relax. And that's perfectly good, but the reality is when you tap the tendon, you set up a vibration wave in the muscle, and it's that vibration that's actually directly activating or changing the length of the spindle. And so that's what's triggering the response. Okay, so that's it, and this is just kind of showing, again, schematically what happens when you, when you, when you do this in terms of action potential. So in the afferent neuron, you get a, a burst of action potentials there, which will then uh, generate a burst of action potentials in the motor neuron that goes back to the muscle with the active spindle, causing that to contract. You'll also activate the inhibitory inner neuron to cause inhibition in the motor neurons to the antagonistic muscles, and so you see a decrease in firing, and so the muscle relaxes. Uh, and so that's your phasic stretch reflex. Um, what about muscle tone? Uh, muscle tone is something that I always have a hard time trying to explain. Um, muscle tone is mostly, at least the way I think about it is, as indicated here, it's the force with which a muscle resists being lengthened, and you test that in a variety of different ways. Uh, you know, like passively moving joints, and so as you do it, you extend some muscles, you're stretching some, so what does it feel like? And then when you go back the other way, you're stretching the antagonist, uh, and I'm sure you have lots of other ways to do that. And so what you've learned to do is to assess that resistance, uh, and that's muscle tone. Um, and from my understanding, it actually reflects a combination of two factors. One is just the intrinsic property of the muscle that resists deformation. So if you take the muscle out of the body, totally denervate it, and try to stretch it, it's going to resist. Those are the intrinsic properties. And then it can also have a reflex contraction because you are stretching the muscle. Uh, and when you stretch it, you can trigger these reflexes. But it tends to be a fairly slow stretch. It's not a, you know, one of these really fast stretches. And at least from the reading that I've done, my sense is it really varies from person to person. Some people are just really good at relaxing. I mean, they just turn into a wet noodle. And when you test muscle tone in such an individual, it's pretty much just the intrinsic properties of the muscle that you're assessing. Uh, some people, like me, can't relax. I'm not a good relaxer. So, you know, when, I, when this is done to me, they say, relax, relax. You know, I just can't do it. Um, and so in such individuals, you have a combination of 
the intrinsic properties of the muscle along with reflex contraction and exactly why the reflex circuits are a little more active in individuals that can't relax well is, is not clear to me. But that stretch, presumably through uh, the static bag and the nuclear chain fibers, and then the 1A and 2 circuits associated with them, will elicit a contraction of that muscle in response to the lengthening, and that's the added reflex component. Uh, for people that are really good at relaxing, if you want to get a sense of um, you know, reflex component, you can do these reinforcement maneuvers, have them do math, clench their jaw, and for reasons, again, that I don't understand, uh, that seems to activate a lot of the spinal cord circuitry so that it's just a little more sensitive. Uh, and so it will respond better to slight, slight changes in input from the receptor. Does that kind of fit your experience? Have I said it well? I'd like to know. I mean, if I've got something wrong, you can educate me afterwards. Because um, I've never tested muscle tone, so I don't really know. Okay, so that's the spindle. In a little bit, I'm going to come back to what happens in, in lesions and have a discussion there. But before I get to there, I want to talk just a little bit about the Golgi tendon organ. Uh, and again, what I want to emphasize here is it's, it's in the tendon at the muscle tendon junction. And the important point is that a subset of muscle fibers uh, will actually insert into a given receptor. Uh, and when those muscle fibers contract, the tension they generate is very efficiently transmitted to the receptor to activate it and send a signal into the CNS. The same website. Uh, also has a thing on, on the spindles. Just a minute. All right. All right. So, all right. That's about as small as it's going to get. So here's the receptor. Uh, at kind of low mag and high mag. It's a great schematic because it actually depicts what's going on. Uh, the receptor itself is just a bunch of collagen bundles or fibers that are enclosed in a, a connective tissue capsule. Um, and the innervation is by a 1B fiber, which again is basically a very large, heavily myelinated axon, very similar to the 1A. Uh, but the 1Bs innervate goes to tendon organs, the 1A inter innervate spindles. And the axons actually kind of intertwine amongst the uh, collagen bundles within the receptor. And this is kind of showing you a little bit of that. And here are the extrafusal fibers that insert into the receptor. Uh, and um, uh, the idea here is what happens when you actually contract the muscle. Uh, and what you're seeing here would be action potentials. And in the lower trace, it would be uh, force. Uh, yeah, I can't get it to go smaller, but uh, you're not seeing the baseline here, but that's OK. So now we'll turn the, OK. And so. It's an exquisitely sensitive receptor to the tension generated by muscle contraction. And if any of you want to deal with this in, in a little more detail, um, you know, you can, there's all kinds of texts and tells you all about it. It's a very nice website. Um, so, the take home from all of this is as a, as a receptor, um, the way to think about it is it, it's a tension receptor. And it signals the CNS about the tension generated by active muscles. Uh, and it's really very sensitive to that. Now, um, in, in this slide, I lost my cursor, there we go. Um, this is more of a little bit of history uh, and also correcting what fortunately doesn't remain in too many textbooks. But sort of looking at the history of s studies of these sort of reflexes of muscle origin, the spindle was found first, and so spindles respond to stretch. And tons of work, really very elegant work, was done looking at spindles and how they respond to stretch and all that kind of stuff. And then they found Golgi tendon organs. And so what they did is they tested Golgi tendon organs, their response to stretch. And they respond very poorly to stretch you have to stretch the hell out of that muscle tendon complex to actually activate the receptor. And so that led to the idea that this was really a, a receptor that was designed to, oh, I, I guess I should say one other thing for this to make sense, 
the reflex response when you activate it in that kind of a context is to cause the, uh, in this case, the, the very heavily stretched muscle uh, to kind of relax and its antagonists uh, uh, to contract. And so in the context of a, of, of a contracting muscle, the idea would be it would cause the contracting muscle to relax and its antagonists to contract. Is everybody with me? I said exactly the same thing that Helen did. I just didn't say it the same way. Um, that's that so-called autogenic inhibition. Uh, and that led to the idea that the receptor is really designed to be a protective receptor to keep the muscle from uh, generating too much potentially damaging tension. Uh, but what we now know is that idea is completely wrong. So if any of you have that idea, because you were taught that way back, not too way back as I look out in the audience, um, you got to just trash that idea because it's not correct. The receptor is exquisitely sensitive to muscle contraction. Uh, even a very modest muscle contraction uh, will activate the receptor. And so that kind of maybe makes you think, well, why would contraction work and stretch not work? Um, and the reason actually relates to the organization of the receptors. Again, keep in mind that only a minor subset of the muscle fibers actually insert into the receptor. When you stretch the whole muscle tendon complex, that force is distributed among all the elements. And so the extrafusal fibers that might insert into that receptor really aren't going to be, the individual ones aren't going to be stretched very much when you stretch the whole complex. And that's why you have to stretch it enormously to get a response. Uh, and so here they're showing the weight. You're, you're clearly lengthening the muscle with this weight, but uh, you're not getting much of a response from, from, the, uh, uh, from the receptor, and you really have to stretch it a lot. However, when the muscle contracts, and especially when those extrafusal fibers that insert into the receptor contract, the tension they generate is very efficiently uh, transmitted to the receptor. And so they respond right away. So they're not protective at all. They're very exquisite tension receptors. Uh, and their purpose is to signal the CNS through the 1B fiber about the tension generated by um, active muscles. And ultimately, it's the signal from that that really gives people their sense of muscular effort. Everybody with me? Okay. All right. Um, so this is just showing the reflex circuit uh, when, when the receptor is activated. And this diagram shows exactly what Helen showed. Uh, it's a disynaptic circuit through uh, an inhibitory interneuron that will inhibit uh, motor neurons to the muscle that's contracting, causing it to relax. Uh, and excite motor neurons to antagonist muscles, causing them to contract. Uh, and so this is the kind of reflex that, if you didn't control it well, would obviously interfere with ongoing activities. You contract one muscle, then you'd be caused to relax it, contract the antagonist, and so on, and you're stuck forever in a do loop. Um, and part of what's being shown here uh, are descending projections from higher levels that play down onto these inner neurons of the reflex circuit, and they modulate them. And they modulate them in a way uh, to tailor the reflex uh, circuit, the gain of the circuit, to whatever the ongoing task is. And I think this is incredibly uh, great example of, of how reflexes really are tailored to, to context. Um, this is looking at uh, the reflex circuit in a fully relaxed muscle. Uh, or I, what I should say is a muscle that's kind of it's, it's, it's going to be caused to contract by stimulating the nerve to it. So you're, it's not in a volitional activity. It's not part of something. You're just kind of doing it that way. And you're looking at activity in the motor neuron to that muscle when you cause the muscle to contract. Uh, and so this is, the, so it's not shown here, but there's an electrode in that neuron. Uh, and what you can see is that the neuron gets inhibited. Uh, so this is the potential change. If I said enough to make, have this make sense? Are you with me? Questions? Now, in this example, what they're doing is they're recording from the motor neuron um, while the 1B afferents are being stimulated during walking. And now you get depolarization. So, again, it kind of, the, the whole point is reflexes are not absolutely stereotyped. They really are uh, context dependent. The response is, is controlled in a lot of different ways.
And when you have interneurons interposed between the afferent neuron and the efferent neuron, you have lots of opportunity for that kind of modulation because you'll have lots of inputs to those interneurons to control their gain. Okay. So uh, here's the same diagram I showed before. Um, and it kind of makes the point that, uh, again, this would be the spinal cord. You have motor neurons here. These are interneuronal circuits within the spinal cord. Uh, you have, at least in terms of the stretch reflex, uh, the monosynaptic, but you also have multisynaptic through interneurons. Uh, and in the case of the Golgi tendon organ, which really isn't shown in this, um, uh, you, you would have the, the multisynaptic uh, things. And these interneurons, as well as the motor neurons, get input from various brainstem levels. And they also get input from other types of receptors. And in the healthy individual, the gain is set at a particular level for that person. Uh, and they have the particular reflex responses that, that you're used to seeing. Um, what happens when you lose the descending inputs? Uh, acutely, it can, it can vary. There tends to be a decrease, and, but that decrease over time changes to uh, what is uh, an exaggeration in the reflexes. So the phasic stretch reflexes get exaggerated, as does muscle tone. And there's been a lot of interest in kind of trying to understand what's going on to, to cause those, those changes. Uh, and as I kind of said at the beginning, I'm not sure there's really good agreement in that. But I want to have a little discussion with you and uh, maybe I can teach you a thing or two and then I'm hoping actually you can teach me something as well because again uh, I don't really see these kinds of things and, 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 and people get to experience them directly. So spasticity which is the increase in phasic uh, stretch reflexes as well as uh, muscle tone is a common sequela of lesions uh, in the brain or spinal cord that interrupt these descending tracks. And there, there are variations in how it manifests depending on where the lesion is, and I don't understand that real well. I'm not going to get into that discussion. Uh, but, you know, what is spasticity, and what do we know about its, its basis? And uh, this is a definition that I keep seeing when I read papers about spasticity. They refer back to this paper by Lance in 1980, um, that it's a motor disorder characterized by a velocity-dependent increase in tonic stretch reflexes, that is muscle tone, with exaggerated phasic stretch reflexes, such as the tendon jerks, and in his definition, resulting from hyperexcitability of the stretch reflex. So something in that circuit is, is activated as one component of the upper motor neuron syndrome. So that's the definition that I most commonly see. Is this one that you guys use, or do you have something that's more practical? Okay. What we now know is that spasticity is multifactorial. Uh, it involves changes in the muscles themselves. It also involves changes in the physiology of the spinal cord circuitry that underlies tonic uh, and phasic stretch reflexes. Uh, and I'd like to at least give you a little bit of information on that. So what are some of the factors? Uh, one is, and this is, this is actually kind of interesting, there's downregulation of certain uh, um, uh, transporters in neurons that are denervated by these kinds of, of injuries, that is neurons of the spinal cord circuits. And this is obviously work that's been done uh, mostly in experimental animals. I don't know to what extent they've determined whether the same thing occurs in humans. That might prove to be uh, difficult to sort out. But there's a particular transporter, a potassium chloride transporter, that gets downregulated. And the net effect of this is actually to reduce the hyperpolarizing effect of inhibitory transmitters. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to get into that in, in great detail. I did in the notes section of the PowerPoint, which I don't know if you've got yet, but I did make it available. Um, I have the references for, for, for each of these. Um, so glycine and GABA are your, your typical inhibitory transmitters. Uh, but during development, early in development, these transmitters are actually excitatory. And one of the changes that takes place that leads to them becoming, generating an inhibitory effect is the upregulation of this transporter. This has been clearly demonstrated in experimental animals. Um, and so if you're then going to downregulate this as a result of an injury that gets rid of the, the, the sort of the upper motor neurons that project down to the spinal cord, you're now going to have less of this co-transporter around, but you can still have lots of glycine and GABA. Uh, and instead of producing inhibitory effect, they're now going to have excitatory effects. 
And so that can lead to increased activity. Something going on because of denervation, it's a response to denervation uh, of these neurons of the spinal cord reflex circuits. So you're saying if we're done to a stable That's the idea. It either, it's 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 part of, thin or like, um, or something that increases like cavernarchic transmission uh, that's what you would think, and I guess your experience is it doesn't. I haven't seen that, no, but just like by the mechanism that you're describing. Part of it is going to depend on, um, on exactly where the synapse is on the neuron. Uh, and now I'm really stretching my understanding of all this, but... Yeah, yeah, there'd be a like, different place that interact with different fabrics. Well, but I'm thinking in relation to the, um, basically the axon initial segment where ultimately you want your summation to reach threshold or not. Uh, things that are further away uh, might have more of a less inhibitory effect as opposed to actually producing an excitatory effect. Synapses that are going to be closer will have more of a chance of actually producing an excitatory effect. And so maybe the net effect with, when you use these drugs is to affect things that are, or maybe more of the inputs are more peripheral. Although a lot of times they say the inhibitory ones tend to be closer. Um, the paper will talk about it better than I can, if, if you're interested. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing that changes quite a lot is actually the muscle. Uh, in individuals that acutely experience these, these injuries, uh, the muscles aren't used. Uh, you know, acutely, they can be fully paralyzed uh, or you know, partially. Um, and so the muscles tend not to be used, and so the limbs are just kind of held in a position, oftentimes keeping the muscle in a, in a shortened length. And if muscles are kind of held in a shortened length for too long, there's a lot of changes that take place in the muscle. There's an increase in connective tissue elements. There's actually demonstration that there's a decrease in the number of sarcomeres uh, due to enhanced catabolism of contractile proteins. And so the muscle gets shorter. And now you go to test tone, well, you got a shorter muscle. You're going to be giving it the same kind of movements you're used to giving it, and now you're going to get more resistance, a change entirely at the level of the muscle. Um, and that's thought to be uh, a big deal in at least some of the hypertonia that's associated uh, with uh, these kinds of injuries. Um, and then there's this phenomenon called post-activation depression, which I have a slide that goes into, and this clearly... Uh, decreases as a result of injury. Uh, Post-activation depression is a decrease in transmitter release from 1A terminals during repetitive stimulation. So the, the stimulation has to occur with a particular frequency. Now I, I want to kind of, I didn't, don't have this here, I'm kind of running out of time. Are you interested enough to hear me out? Do you have a few more minutes? Okay. Uh, I, I don't know if you have somewhere you really have to go. I don't want to keep you from that. Um, but um, a question was asked uh, in relation to the, the earlier lecture that is the hyperactivity associated with these reflexes due to a change in the nature of the activity that's, that, that remains in the descending pathways? And there's a lot of sources that talk about that. Um, some of the descending inputs have a predominantly excitatory effect. Some have a predominantly inhibitory effect uh, on, on the target neurons in, in, in the spinal cord. Uh, and it's thought that, or at least it's been argued, that what you lose is mostly the inhibitory effects. And so the gain is set up because you have preserved excitatory inputs from higher levels. I don't know if that was the idea that you were getting at. I never liked that idea. That doesn't mean it's not right, but I just never liked it. Um, first of all, with those injuries, acutely, you ought, ought right away change the balance yet spasticity tends to be more prolonged before it manifests itself. You also get spasticity, perhaps manifest differently, but you get it with a complete spinal cord transection, so you're gonna lose all the excitatory inhibitory. So the logic never worked for me. Um, and at least a lot of the papers that I read now that are trying to understand what's going on tend to focus much more on what's going on locally in the spinal cord and changes in the neurons within the spinal cord as a result of the denervation by the injury. It's not a change in balance of excitatory and inhibitory inputs, but you've denervated these neurons and they change. They change their response characteristics. Um, 
here's one example, here's another. Um, and then the muscle itself changes as well. And so at least my sense is um, it's more local stuff in the spinal cord and also in the muscle that really underlies spasticity as opposed to this change in balance between excitatory and inhibitory. The logic just doesn't work for me. Again, that doesn't mean I'm right. It just doesn't work for me. Um, okay, so uh, post-activation depression. Uh, you can kind of see that here. This is the healthy individual. I don't know if you can read it, but that's for the healthy individual. Uh, and this is the experimental setup. Uh, they're, they're looking at two things. One is uh, stoleus, the, the stretch reflex due to uh, stretching the soleus muscle, and the other is the soleus H reflex. Are you all familiar with what the H reflex is? Yes, no. If you're not, I'll, I'll give it a quick. I'll give a quick, quick explanation. All right. So here's here's the setup. So the individual sitting in a chair that's holding their leg in a particular posture, uh, and their foot is in a device that can basically, if the foot is sitting like this, it can do this. So it'll stretch the soleus and other muscles back there. But they're focusing on the soleus, uh, and they can express they can stretch it at a particular frequency. Uh, and then they're they're looking at. Uh, they also have force transducers in there, so they can look at the, the resulting contraction that results from that. Um, the H reflex is basically a way to bypass the spindle. So what they do is they stimulate, Helen, I need your help here, whatever nerve is over here. That would, would be uh, from the, the spindles in the soleus. Is that the common perineal nerve? Some nerve kind of in the back, that's close to the back of the knee that you can stimulate from the surface. You guys should know that. Take All right. See, I, I don't know that stuff. You're outside the brain, so it's not my stuff. And so you bypass the spindle, uh, and so you'll activate the one A's to activate the reflex. Um, and so it's it's just another way to, to do the same thing. And what's very well documented in healthy individuals, uh, whether you assess the soleus, the stretch reflex directly or through the H reflex, is as the frequency of stimuli increases, uh, to a certain point, you then get an inhibition in, in the response. And that inhibition in the response is, is due to a decreased probability of transmitter release from the 1A fiber onto the target motor neurons. Uh, exactly what's causing that, I haven't been able to figure out, so I have a feeling uh, it may not actually be known, but as a, as a response, it's very well documented. And in individuals with spasticity, either due to multiple sclerosis or spinal cord injury, the degree of that inhibition is reduced. And so maybe whatever's going on here is contributing to spasticity. Although, again, in order to really see that, you need to have your stimuli delivered at a fairly uh, rapid frequency of, you know, a stimulus every one or two or three se seconds. And I don't know that you normally would do that. So exactly how this would, would manifest uh, in terms of how, how a patient with spasticity presents uh, is unclear to me, but this could have um, potential consequences. If you think about an individual who has an injury that has spasticity but still has some function left, so they can move. Uh, if you ask them to rapidly you know, move a body part that they still have the ability to do that, maybe not well, but they still have the ability, uh, as they contract the muscle to move, the antagonists are going to be stretched and in effect at a fairly rapid frequency. Uh, and maybe because of this, then the antagonists will be more likely uh, to change the response. That is to have more of a response to that stretch than, than normally would be. Uh, and so that could contribute to spasticity. It could also contribute at least to a deficit, um, at least when they attempt more rapid movements, to the extent that they have the ability to do that. Does that make sense? A little bit. You need to think about it. I had to think a lot about it before it kind of... Uh, um, made sense to me. This paper actually talks about it and discusses it very nicely, so you might want to look at that for detail. So does spasticity actually contribute to the spastic movement disorder? And this seems to be a very common kind of theme in a number of the papers that, that I looked at getting ready for this. Um, and I think what they mean by spastic movement disorder would be, you know, the weakness that results from from losing all the descending projections. Uh, so they have difficulty with locomotion, um, slowing and stepping, slowing and voluntary limb movements, and they'll have decreased dexterity. And so all of these are a result of 
the loss of the descending inputs uh, from the cerebral cortex and the brainstem that are required to carry out these movements in, in what would be considered you know, a normal manner. So does spasticity actually contribute to this? Um, I, I don't know the answer, but I, I'm kind of parroting a little bit what I've read. Uh, a big part of this is spasticity uh, is typically measured in muscles at rest or individuals at rest to the extent that they can be. Uh, so it's a passive state. Uh, and clearly, you know, individuals have exaggerated reflexes. But what's interesting is when investigators kind of assess these reflexes during volitional activities in individuals that have spasticity, so obviously they have some function remaining. Um, what they find is the ability to elicit these reflexes during volitional activity in individuals with spasticity versus healthy individuals is really not very different. So you don't see the exaggeration during the attempt to move for individuals that have the ability to still move. And so that's been an argument that spasticity per se doesn't contribute to disability. That is the difficulty in moving. It's more the loss of the descending projections. Um, and so many would argue that sp spasticity may have li limited significance uh, for functional disability in individuals that have spasticity uh, as a result of these lesions, as long as they have some movement activity that remains. And so that kind of then leads to the discussion of should you treat spasticity as measured in the passive state? That is, should you try to get the reflexes so they're not hyperactive? Should you get tone, try to reduce tone? Uh, and uh, again, I don't have the experience, so I'm kind of just saying the, the arguments that have been, been made in the papers is they say if individuals have certain function that remains, it may actually be detrimental to them to try to treat spasticity. I, I'm be curious to know afterwards if this is your experience, um, because you in, in treating them, you're going to ultimately make them weaker. And so the function that they have may be lost, even though you're fixing the spasticity or, or the hypertonia, and maybe that's not worth it. Uh, they've also made the argument for individuals that sometimes the hypertonia allows them to locomote because it gives them the strength to maintain an upright posture so they can then, whatever function they have, they can use to try to move along. So uh, for me, it's an interesting discussion. I don't know enough to really take a stand on it, but I kind of raise it for you guys to think about because this is kind of what you do on a regular basis. So I'd be curious to know what you think. So, so what, what, what are spindles? What, what do they really do? Um, and to what extent really does the, at least the monosynaptic reflex contribute to what they do? And that's kind of what this next couple of slides deals with. Uh, and I like this slide, although it's, it's clearly incorrect, because it kind of at least raises the issue. Uh, to me, muscle spindles are length and length change detectors. I mean, that's what they do. So what they're showing here is you, you generate a command to hold your elbow uh, at 90 degrees of flexion against the load, the load being the mug. Uh, and so that command is going to come down from the cortex, uh, directly, indirectly, whatever, to generate the necessary contraction to do this. Uh, you then increase the load by filling the mug with, with whatever. Um, and so uh, until a response is made to correct that, you're then going to lose 90 degrees of flexion. You're gonna, the elbow is going to extend. Uh, and then it's going to correct because the command is to keep it at 90 degrees of flexion. What's the role of, of the spindle uh, and its circuitry, lo lo spinal cord circuitry, in this correction response? And the implication in the schematic is that uh, the local reflexes can actually mediate the correction because you're going to stretch the muscle. That's going to lead to increased activity from the spindle. There, and from that increased activity from the motor neurons, so the muscle will contract a little more and bring the elbow back to 90 degrees of flexion. Um, the thing is, the spindle can't generate enough activity to do this against much of a load, so it it's really doesn't work. It may contribute, but it's not enough. So the idea here is you have the command to do generate work against a, a load, and the spindles are going to be providing information about muscle length from those active muscles. Uh, when there's a disturbance so that the muscle length changes, in this case it increases, 
uh, the spindle is going to provide an increase in activity that may help bring uh, the muscle back. But I think more importantly, much more importantly, uh, in this corrective response is what's shown here, which would be the projections up to the cerebellum and the cerebral cortex via the, uh, the posterior white column system that, that Helen talked about, as well as the spinal cerebellar systems. And these are going to change the activity in the descending inputs um, to uh, change activity in the motor neurons to really make the correction. Maybe the local reflex circuits can do a little bit, but they can't do much. They don't have enough gain to really uh, do much of a correction. This is where the correction takes place. And this is a slide that just kind of talks about some of the circuitry, and, and Helen already did that. Uh, so the concept here, at least with these black arrows, is it's the proprioceptive function of the spindles, and for that matter, the Golgi tendon organs, that are really key in providing that type of information to those brain areas that can use it to then modulate ongoing movement activity. And so the spindles and the Golgi tendon organs are really key sources of this. They're not the only sources, but they, they are the key sources that, that give your brain either at a conscious level or at an unconscious level, but it allows the brain to do good, good things with that, to uh, know the static position of the limbs, the movement of the limbs, and the sense of muscular effort, and to adjust those as needed to make sure that the ongoing activity is in line with the intended activity. So exactly what the reflex circuitry is doing in that functional context is not clear. There is some evidence that it can do certain things in certain contexts, uh, but overall I think it's really that proprioceptive function relaying that information to other levels that's, that's most significant in terms of the functional context. And then the last thing I was going to tell you about is about the gamma motor neurons and uh, at least one aspect of what is so important about them functionally. Um, and I'm going to go through that really fast. Uh, the idea here is you contract a muscle, so the muscle shortens, and in the absence of any gamma activity, what's going to happen is the muscle shortens, uh, is the spindle's going to shorten, and when the spindle shortens or becomes slack, it can't sense length change. And that's kind of what's, what, what it's showing here. So as the muscle contracts, the spindle gets slack, and if you look at activity from the spindle, there's this period while the muscle is shortened that there's no signal at all. And if there's a disturbance that takes place in this, in this time that leads to uh, a muscle length increase, the spindle's not going to know it. It won't be able to detect it. It won't be able to signal the brain. Muscle length has changed. It's no longer appropriate for the intended activity. So you won't. And the idea is that the gammas, uh, in part, function to correct that by having the gammas coactivate with the alpha motor with, with, with the alphas, so that as the muscle contracts, there will be a length change in in the intrafusal fibers of the spindle that's kind of coordinated with the muscle length shortening associated with contraction, so that the spindle won't go slack. And that's what's happening here. You're activating the muscle to contract. Uh, you're activating gammas uh, to prevent the the spindle from going slack. And so during the contraction, the spindle is actually sensitive. It can send signals, it can detect length change, and signal the CNS about it. And the way this works, again, keep in mind that the contractile apparatus and the intrafusal fibers are at the polar ends. Uh, so when the gammas are active, it's going to cause the polar ends to contract, and so the central regions will be stretched. Uh, and the idea is they're stretched enough to keep them from going slack, so they can continue to send length information back to the CNS. Uh, so the CNS can monitor what's going on at those active muscles. So the idea of alpha gamma coactivation uh, is at least one aspect of gamma function. Uh, I won't spend time talking about this slide, but it's actually some of the evidence that this really occurs in humans, recording from uh, individual fibers in humans. So that's one aspect of, of gamma function. That's certainly not the only one, uh, but it's one that's certainly uh, functionally very important. Uh, that's really all I had to say. I apologize for going over. I know that's not a nice thing to do. Uh, but uh, anyway, I had fun talking. Hope you had fun listening. And I certainly would value your input about some of the perspectives that, we, we, that I put out there in terms of educating me, because I don't do this stuff for a living, so I just read about it. You can't always get a, an accurate sense of what's going on by reading. You guys actually do it. So anyway, thanks. <laughs>